Well, because uh, we put out his music worldwide, yeah. the catalog of 50 albums, plus compilations, plus uh, vinyl. Yeah. You know, we have a series of um, vinyl box sets yeah. that we put out that we invite uh, respected artists to curate. Yeah. The first was Questlove from The Roots. The second was Ginger Baker. Yeah. The third was Brian Eno. Yeah. And we're just in the process of asking Erica Badu to do the box four. Oh. You know, because we've got 50 albums, so we take the original sleeve, the original album, exactly how it was, and we put them out uh, in these box sets. Okay. And also individually, because, okay. you know, the, the vinyl market is growing worldwide. Yes. Yes. Um, it's a bit of a problem that there aren't enough uh, uh, vinyl factories to keep up with demand, so it takes a long time to actually organize getting something out. But anyway, we're putting out a lot of vinyl as well. You know, um, okay, I met Fella first, met him first, yeah. um, in the back of a Mercedes van on the M4 motorway in the United Kingdom. What year was this? Uh, late 70s. Okay. Um, lying in a heap of African dancers on our way back from a show, somebody put on a cassette and it was sorrow, tears, and blood. And I'd, I'd never heard fella before, you know? And this thing came on, ah. I was just, you know, sometimes you hear something and it just grabs you. Yeah. And I was listening to this, you know, everybody run, run, run. Everybody scatter, scatter. Some people lost some bread. Someone nearly died. Someone just died. Police, they come, army, they come. Confusion everywhere, ah. Seven minutes later, all done, cool down, brother. Police don't go away. Army don't disappear. Them leave sorrow, tears, and blood. Them regular trademark. And I was just, ah. So anyway, I went away and I did some research and found out some more, you know. Then I met somebody who, uh, who knew one of the people that was working with him. And he was in London on tour. And at the time I was working on a rainforest festival. I wanted to invite artists from all the rainforest countries around the world to come together. Plus people that could talk about the issues of deforestation. And uh, so I put together a, a proposal because I wanted Fella to join my board of advisors and also to come play at the festival. So I put uh, a leather bound uh, proposal together and I knocked, it was in the winter and I had a hat and a coat and a scarf and I knocked on the door and he called me in because he used to leave the key in the outside of the door in his hotel. And I went in this room. Oh, it was like a sauna bath, man. I used to carry extra heaters in addition to whatever was provided by the establishment. And the room was full of pretty girls and fell in his uh, speedos as usual. And I sat down next to him and I gave him this proposal and he was leafing through the thing. And I was talking into his ear. I can't remember what I said, but I said something and he spun around to look at me and we both started to laugh and we just became friends, man, in that instant. And it was a friendship that was to endure for the rest of his life. And, uh, you know, people say you shouldn't work with friends. I only want to work with friends. You know, because you can say more or less anything to your friend, more or less, right? Anything to your friend. So people would say, ah, fella is difficult, no? I say, no, not for me. You know, uh, not for me. Fellow was never difficult. Sometimes he would make radical decisions, yeah. and people say, "Oh, Ricky, look what fellas do." And I go, "Why?" Because I knew the basis on which those decisions were made. You know, before a fellow would decide um, whether or not to do something, when he rehearsed for his performance, you know, when he was putting a song together. In the afternoon in the shrine, there'll be four or five hundred people, the real aficionados sitting there, you know. I know, if I accused him of this, he would yab me for it, but I know that before he would make a decision, he would ask himself, what would those people think if I did this? And if the answer came back, they wouldn't like it, he wouldn't do it. Even if the answer came back, hmm, he still wouldn't do it. Now, I can't argue with that. 
those were his people. Those, that was the, the rock on which his um, mission was founded, you know, um, the underground spiritual game. Yeah. So um, that's why uh, for me now, I feel, <laughs> I feel he's, he's like he's still there in a way, you know. At his funeral, they were shouting, fellow will live forever. And of course, it's right. You know, it's, it's true. And unfortunately, his message is still terribly relevant. Not just here in Nigeria, but worldwide. You know, uh, issues of corruption, of uh, social injustice, uh, of mismanagement. I mean, these were issues that fella, you know, he studied, man. He wasn't just making uh, willy-nilly uh, pr uh, pronunciations. He knew what he was talking about. He had a, he was a visionary. He was an extraordinary guy. And the licks, man, the licks that he took. When he picked up his saxophone to play, he had to really struggle himself into a place where he could <laughs> operate. Ah. And he said, oh, well, they didn't kill me. <laughs> No, I am that guy. Yeah, we had a lot. We spent more time laughing and messing around than anything else, to be honest with you. But uh, we traveled, you know, sometimes 70 people on the road. Yeah, uh, and, you had to, and you had to organize that. Yeah, that's my job. Never missed a plane, man. Yeah. Never missed a, I'm kind of proud of that, you know. <laughs> yeah, you should. Yeah. Um, my greatest moment, wow. Hmm. I tell you something, in terms of my relationship with who, who fellow was, his funeral. I mean, I don't want to say that's the greatest moment I spent with fella, because it's, but that funeral, man, you know, a million people came to pay their respect. Even people that didn't agree with him, they still came. Every walkway, every window, every uh, bridge, every ah. And that bridge to VI was full of people, both sides. It took us to get from Tafawa Balewa to uh, Pepple Street, which is, oh, yeah, which is where we were doing the ceremony with the family. It took seven hours and a pickup truck with a band in it <laughs> was in front of us playing fella tune and I danced from uh, VI to Ikeja that day man wow that was something um, I think it was Yeni that phoned me yeah I came down, yeah. came down, and I combed his hair in the morgue and shaved him and put a big spliff in his hand. Uh, he was a great guy, man. He was a wonderful guy. I loved him dearly, and I'm a self-appointed guardian of his legacy because I loved him so much and want to make sure that legacy is respected. And I think so far we're doing okay, you know. We've still got a road to hoe. I still meet people. You know, you meet people, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, yeah. uh, uh, cultivated, yeah. and you have nice conversation, and then I say, blah, 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 fella. They look like, oh my God. The guy don't know who I'm talking about. So I feel like I'm a bit of an evangelist, you know, because now I've, I've sympathized with the guy, so now I need to explain to him who it was, this guy, which I'm happy to do. Um, because um, he was exceptional, he was exceptional. So we're, you know, we're winning the day. Uh, you know, we had uh, the fella musical uh, on Broadway, which played played for 15 months to half a million people. It was toured all over America twice. Also opened at the National Theatre in London and was sold out there. And then in 2011, I brought the whole shebang, um, I, you know, as part of a team. I was the executive producer who brought 40 tons of equipment and 80 people <laughs> to Lagos, which was somewhat of a challenge in the land of lastminute.com. 
But we made it, man. We cracked it. I, only because I put an amazing team of people together from Mali, from Calabar, from uh, London, from New York, from Marseille, from oh. Uh, and they work round the clock, day after day after day. And we finished up, you know, we opened at the shrine. We did a concert version at the shrine. And uh, I remember at the rehearsal, all the old aficionados were sitting there smoking their spliffs. And they say, ah, and they saw these white boys clap because the band was primarily a white band, you know. Ah, what is this? You know, they saw these white boys climbing up on the stage. I say, hey, you people are going to be shocked. And they say, mm, really? Ah, no. they start playing, man. I mean, these guys are good. These guys are top. And they were, hey! <laughs> they were really knocked out. Then the girls came on. Hey! <laughs> then Fella came on. It took them a while, you know, because there's not much of a, a theatrical convention here. So there's, they were looking, who, what? But then this, the guy who plays Fella, his name is San Gauja. Yeah. Does he look like Fella? No. But I swear to you, man, that guy makes my hair stand on end. There are moments when Fella comes down. You know, the guy is there. I think it was Zombie. And suddenly everybody s understood. The place went wild. You know, they never used to applaud Fella in the shrine. Because you're all playing the underground spiritual game. You, as a member of the audience, are implicated in what's taking place. The music comes to you, you deal with it and send it back. And the thing goes up to that place that we all love to be in. I'd like to spend the rest of my life there. And uh, that's the underground spiritual game. But this day, the place went crazy. Then we moved the whole thing to Echo. And we had to build... a. Um, a proscenium arch theatre in the middle of a 400 foot wide venue, which was quite a challenge, you know. Um, and uh, the difference between playing that show in Lagos as opposed to this New York or London, in New York or London it's a story. In Lagos it's his story, you know. So Certainly for young people, everybody knows Fella, but they don't necessarily know that much about him, you know. And that play, uh, I don't know if you saw it, but um, it, it, uh, it tells his story. Yeah, it tells so his... It, ah, well, it's the same show. Yeah. It tells his story. And uh, so I feel, you know, pretty proud about that. Okay. We've stopped touring it now because it's too unwieldy. You need five articulated lorries on the road. 94 people to do the loading. So what we've done now is we've stripped the story out and left the music and dance. So it's now a concert. And we opened it at the Adelaide Festival in Australia uh, last year. And we're going to start touring it. And I hope we're going to bring it here to uh, Nigeria. I don't think so. It was just one integral story for Fella, you know. Um, he was concerned. A uh, fella could have lived anywhere in the world, you know, but he stayed here in Nigeria in the same way that Sheon or, or Femi or Yeni, they're here. Um, there's a commitment. The family of, we have to remember, the family are a family of social reformers. You know, his uh, younger brother was a president of the Nigerian Medical Association. His older brother finished up as secretary general of the World Health Organization. You know, these are people, and the mother, you know, was a real firebrand. She was a fighter. Unfortunately, I never met her. She passed before I came along. Um, so Fella was, in that sense, was just following the, the pattern that his family had created. Um, I even found, when we were doing research for the Fella musical, JJ, you know, the grandfather, um, had gone to London in the 20s and recorded uh, hymns, you know, um, for EMI, yes, yeah, so he, he made records at that time. I went to the British Library and I did research and I found those recordings. And we actually used one or two of them in, in the musical. No, nobody dies of natural causes in Africa. <laughs> Everybody is, <laughs> some winch came and, oh. Fella, they say Fella died of AIDS. As far as I'm concerned, he died of one beating too many. You know, he was a giant of a man, but he was a man. You know, the, 
the system can only take so much. And they did for him, man. They did for him. You know, uh, it got to a point where he couldn't play his saxophone. He was in pain. The guy was in pain. So, that's my own view anyway. That's my own view. Not really, not really. I was just dealing with whatever was going on, you know. The fellow was, he was loved, you know. I mean, loved. The first time I experienced that, um, sitting in uh, his brother's VW ambulance, the fellow was driving, and we came around a corner into a Goslo, and somebody saw him, and the whole street came. Wow. Abami. Yeah, Abami Chief priest. And in a way, you know, if it was in London, it, it, oh, look, it's Paul McCartney. Oh, yeah. Every, it was, it's not the same. Yes. This was people giving him energy, saying, you, you know, you're fighting for us. We support you, you know. And I, I just melted now. <laughs> I was done. You know, um, and I've had experiences with fella. One time we were coming back from somewhere at three o'clock in the morning or four o'clock in the morning. We came across the bridge and the fella was driving and suddenly <laughs> there was a huge truck, a truck tire blocking the road. Nobody was there. The second we stopped, they came over the parapet with machete, iron bars, all kind of coming at us, man. Fella wound down the window, put his whole body out, said, bastards! They went, hey, fella! They were gone, man. They were gone. And if it had just been me, I'd have been chopped liver. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, fella was something, man. The fella was, mm. you know, during the time it was curfew. The only vehicle you see on the road at night was fella. You know, you get to the, you get to the, um, roadblock and he'd wind down the window and there'd be this nasty looking policeman there with red eyes and carrying a machine gun man and a fellow would say motherfucker and the guy hasn't seen who it is yet he comes over and he goes hey fella I say bastard wind up the window and drive away <laughs> I once went from um, Lagos to Port Harcourt yeah. on New Year's Eve, oh, sorry, Christmas Eve, and uh, you know every five miles there was a roadblock. Oh, yeah. So they'd say, open the boots. So I get out of the car and I start un undoing the string and I say, okay, I'll open the boot, but you see these two guys in the back, they're sound engineers, we're going to put up a show in Port Harcourt for fella. Fella! Fella's coming? I say, yeah, there's a truck with the equipment and a bus with every... I was lying. Fella was flying, all right? Hey, I'm They start running around excited. Then they'd say, they'd remember themselves, and they'd say, because it's Christmas, right? They'd say, ah, what about my Christmas, man? And I say, hey, you love Fella? They say, yes, of course. I say, happy Christmas, guy. <laughs> I never spent Kobo, man, from Lagos to Port Harcourt. Just on fella's name. Yeah. I think it's unfortunate. <laughs> I think it's unfortunate, but you know, things started in a way and it became sy systemic. Yeah. You know, so, yes, I'm corrupt, became like all right somehow. So, you know, there's a line in one fella song just like that. Nothing to give the youth good example. So if you see people doing this, you feel that you are, it's a license for you two to do the same. So then you end up with people learning how to use uh, high-tech equipment and learning how to code. Doing all that. What do they do? They do 419. What? There's so many other things one can do, but that's where the thinking is, you know? And it's wrong, it's wrong. You know, I see all kinds of talented people here in this Lagos, in this Nigeria. You know, I meet people every day. Me, I give everybody that I meet the right to be fantastic. 
until such time as they prove themselves otherwise, which may or may not ever happen. I hope it doesn't. And I meet people all the time that are really good, you know, really f full of ideas, full of uh, um, energy. And it, it seems like there's a kind of inertia in, in, uh, in power, you know, that just holding everybody down, which is very unfortunate. You have to let talent go. You have to encourage. You have to, you know, uh, create... Um, uh, infrastructure that will in, uh, in allow and enable uh, young uh, gifted people to manifest their, their talent and to grow. You have to do that. Um, but it all seems to be... So you end up with this profound research into mediocrity. You know, just, you know, this worked, so we'll do that, rather than looking yeah. You know, a fellow, when he recorded a song, he never played it again. No, because he was on to something else. It wasn't an issue. The, okay, the record is there if you want to listen to it. Record company executives could beg him. <laughs> it wouldn't make any difference. He said, ah, please, I beg. He's on <laughs> another... Yes, yes. Okay. Not a lot. Not a lot a bit more, it's a little bit more streamlined in some respects, but the overall situation, which is caused by, okay, it's not entirely anybody's fault in the sense that the, the oil price has dropped to whatever it is now, 30 something dollars from 100, so they're broke, you know. Um, but being as it seems, you know, when I, in London there's a street called Bishop's Avenue, it's got these palaces, man. A lot of which are owned by Nigerians, you know. So, you know, how, how come I see people earning four and a half kobo and I see these people driving around in Maserati? I don't begrudge them their Maserati, let me be clear. Although, what the hell you need a Maserati for in Lagos is another question. <laughs> you know, if you meet fine, fine girl and she said, come get me, you can't go, because her road is like this. But um, I look at this imbalance, you know, and it has to come to an end, man, it has to finish. I loved what Bahari said in London when this stupid Prime Minister told the Queen, oh, uh, Nigeria is one of the worst uh, corruption countries. And the Archbishop of Canterbury said, well, there's a new president now. He's, and the Queen said, oh, really? And, um, and then Buhari said, well, yes, there is corruption. And yes, the fruits of, the, of that corruption have, are here in England. So maybe you can arrange for us to get it back. And I thought that was very right. You know, that was very right. You know, if I, if I try to deal with 10,100 pounds, 100, yeah. anything over 10,000, I'm going to get cross-examined, you know, because of uh, money laundering. Now you come with 10 billion, nobody say anything, oh, welcome. So all of that money is sitting in a bank there earning interest. Um, when it really should be supporting and encouraging the youth and creating infrastructure that will allow growth to take place. You have to have growth. You can't just rely on petrol, oil. I mean, we know that whole ridiculous story. Um, but the greatest, for me, the greatest export from Nigeria is the talent of Nigerians. You know, there are more Nigerian doctors outside of Nigeria than there are inside. That's another kind of stuff. But it's understandable, you know, these guys want to go and live a good life and enjoy themselves. And Here is Wahala, right? It's difficult. Yeah. Very difficult. Let's hope for better days, man. Yeah. Well, um, hmm. it seems to me that um, for a while it was kind of abandoned here in Nigeria. Like that, you know, they got 
tangled up in trying to pretend they're from Brooklyn. Um, but in the world, the thing has just kept going. You know, we spent, I and my partner in Fellows Management, Francis Katekian, who alas and alack passed two weeks ago. And we, thank you. We spent 10 years di digitally remastering his back catalog, reconstituting the original sleeves, and then licensed on behalf of the family uh, that catalog to Universal. And the music is, you know, available all over the world now uh, on a steady basis. It's not selling millions, but it's set, you know, it's, the thing is there. And there are plenty of people that respect the guy, you know. And uh, so that thing is going on. But I've, I think that the musical that we brought here yeah. did, you know, has um, echoes now, is creating, creating waves. Uh, we've recently signed with MTN uh, to make uh, Fellas Music available. On MTN Caller Tunes? Uh, Caller Tunes. I, I did, I, I did um, call a, uh, CB, um, CRBT. CRBT's yeah, Caller call Ringback ring back back Tunes on yeah. every Fella song. And I've got 50 that are up on the system now. So um, I'm going to give you the list with all the, the tune codes so that you can uh, show them to your people so they can go, they, you know, wouldn't they like to have da 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 <laughs> <laughs> they would, they would, they would on, on their phone? Yeah. Yes, so that's something that we've done. And we're doing the same operation in uh, Ghana, in South Africa. We're going to Zambia, to uh, Uganda. You know, I think Fellow would be happy, even though they're only 30 seconds long, you know, to know that, you know, his, message, his music is out there around Africa, which is something he didn't really accomplish in his life. I mean, you know, distributing records in Africa is kind of hard, you know, uh, physical records. But now, you know, the, the, the whole um, streaming and uh, uh, digital side of things has come up and everybody's got phone, everybody's got access. Um, I think he would be happy, at least I hope so, you know. Well, the, the funny thing about Afrobeat is it fits any genre. You can do, if it's reggae or, or uh, uh, you know, any, any form of music will fit into Afrobeat. So that's the next project for us is to do you know, there are a lot of artists who respect Fellow deeply and have used his music in one way or another. Um, samples, you know, uh, uh, Most Deaf and uh, Questlove and uh, Soul to Soul. I mean, a lot of people have, are influenced by Fellow. And um, one, one sound, it's like saying one suit. What? No, I don't think one sound. I think that. Um, you know, we like diversity, but at the same time, um, my job is not over, you know. I've still got a road to hoe um, to uh, ensure that that music spreads all over the world. You know, um, Felibration, yeah. um, last year there were 20 Felibrations around the world. Uh, all over America, you know, New York, LA, Chicago, Boston, uh, San Francisco. There was one in Jakarta. Wow. Yes, Indonesia. <laughs> there was one in uh, uh, um, Osaka, Japan. <laughs> there was one in Iceland, in Reykjavik, Iceland. Wow. And it, uh, they weren't part of any master plan. They yeah. just popped up like mushrooms. Yeah to pay respect to fellow. I did one at the British Library in London last year. And what I do is I have a 15-piece Afrobeat orchestra that's led by Dele Shosimi, who, who used to be fellow's keyboardist. And then I invite artists to get up and sing a fellow song, you know. So last year I had uh, Lauren Vula, I had Tony Allen, um, Two-Face came over from uh, Lagos for the thing. Um, oh, it's a beautiful show. You can find it on uh, YouTube, youtube.com uh, forward slash fella. We have a, uh, he has his own channel yeah. there. You can find it and listen to it. So all these things are happening um, in the world. Um, 
and uh, the story is not finished. It's far from, you know, I feel like sometimes we haven't even scratched the surface. Yeah. I think he would, have been, he would be proud of his sons, you know, because they're both front and center. They stand and they talk. You know, I asked, um, a, sorry, a journalist asked uh, Femi uh, in New York last year, um, what do you think is the most significant aspect of Fella's legacy? And he said, you know, when Fella was pronouncing, he took licks. Serious licks. So, in other words, um, what Fella um, achieved was to allow a, a certain degree of tolerance when it comes to pronouncing one's views. So, both uh, Femi and uh, Sheon, uh, you know, they talk. They talk in the same way that Fella talked, and uh, but they don't get the licks. So that's an accomplishment. Um, beyond that. I think Fella would obviously most easily respect the people that respect him. You know, so we're talking about uh, uh, um, Wizkid, we're talking about Ice Prince, uh, Davido, um, Two Face, um, I'm sure others maybe that I don't know as intimately, but I know that those people, they come to shrine, they do things, they do things with Femi, you know, so. Those people there, I got time for them, you know. The other ones, those ones that just uh, uh, ride in the name. Ride in the name, because when you say Afrobeat, you're talking about fella. Yeah. Makes me so angry, man. They don't know what went into putting that thing together, you know. And uh, you have to respect it. You can't. Fella said in an interview, he said, you don't mess around with music. You mess around with music, you're going to come unstuck. Why do you think that happened? Why did it happen? Yeah. It's part of this profound research into mediocrity that I was talking about that allows you to make spurious decisions yeah. and do any damn thing just to make a buck, you know, um, which I think is rather sad, but nevertheless prevails. Not just in Nigeria, it's a worldwide problem, you know, yummy, yummy, chewy, chewy. Uh, the thing has no um, no content, no pr protein, no protein. You know, the thing I was talking about before, you know, that underground spiritual game, that stuff there, when you feel, you know, I, I went to the shrine on Thursday and I danced my ass off, man, for f four hours or whatever it was. Yeah, and that stuff there, you can leave with it. You can carry it with you and spend it elsewhere, which is the definition of protein, okay? what protein is all about. You, you know, you eat and then you can do. So um, the music has power. The music has power. Whether it's used properly is another is issue. And uh, at least we know. And I'm hoping that, uh, you know, things are going to grow. I, when I come to, uh, fellow, I came to celebration not last year because I was doing the one in London, but the year before. Ah, I love it. Man. I mean, two and a half thousand people inside, two and a half thousand people outside, with screens and PA out there as well. And the atmosphere is just electric. I love that. And artist after artist after artist after artist coming through to pay their respects. And nobody gets paid, you know. As we give people expenses. Uh, I love that. I love that. That's a wicked thing to say. Yeah. It's a wicked thing to say, although I understand what they're talking about. Unfortunately, it is a, a phenomena that people die and then suddenly, be, you know, they're... Exploding. Yeah, um, so on that level it's true, but if he was here, he'd still be talking, man. What are you talking about? Yeah. He'd still be open, basket mouth, <laughs> the same basket mouth yeah. as before, unquestionably. Okay, so after Fela, uh, what have you been up to? Ha. Huh. Um, there is no after fella. Okay, with fella. Okay, after fella's passing. Well, we've we've started a label. We're you know, uh, 
I, at the same time I was managing Fala, I also managed Le Ballet Africain, the National Dance Company of Guinea, that I traveled uh, 42 people around the world. At the same time I was managing Fela, in fact. And I remember the day I went to Fela to tell him I was managing the ballet. I wasn't quite sure, I was a bit apprehensive, I didn't know. I said, oh, Fela, uh, uh, he said, what, Ricky, what? I said, no, I just want to let you know um, I'm managing the Ballet Africain now. He said, Ballet Africain? They're hard, man! Because yeah. he saw them at Festac, yeah. you know, in 77. And that was the end of the conversation. <laughs> now, a fellow was fine, man. A fellow was, uh, you know, we had a nice time, man. Nice time. <laughs> I hope that you all go and check out these uh, CRBTs. I'm sure you would want this. I put zombie, I put lady, I put uh, shuffling and smiling. I put Viva Nigeria. Wow. You know, uh, war is not the answer. War can never be the answer. You know, live together, united as one people. Yeah, undivided. Uh, I think it's a nice message. Anyway, so um, check it out. My name is Ricky Steen. I have the privilege of being manager and friend to Fela and Nicola Pucuti. Your check-in, Pulse TV.